Okay, um, first I'd like to thank the organizers and Mark for inviting me here to um, Cape Town to present this. I lived in Cape Town for a year and a half of sabbaticals and it's one of my favorite places in the world and when he said, would you like to come here, I felt like I won the lottery and if you've been to Norway in on November, you'd understand. Um, but I'm also, wanted, I was, as he told you, I was, I'm working on a book about the adaptive challenge of climate change, so I really want to kind of test out and provoke your thinking about adaptation because I kind of think that we're on um, a little bit of the wrong track. <laughs> And so in the next half hour, I'd like to um, present why I think we need to think about climate change differently. Whoops, oh, it needs to be on. So just a quick outline, I'm gonna talk about what I mean by adaptation as opposed to what many climate change researchers mean. I'm gonna distinguish between technical problems versus adaptive challenges, and then discuss how we respond to adaptive challenges. I'm gonna present some examples from Norway where I live and where I've been doing research on adaptation, and I think it's a really good example because Norway really believes it can adapt to anything. And finally, I'll think about what the implications are for research policy and practice. So when we work with adaptation, this is a definition from the fourth assessment report that says um, adaptation is an adjustment in natural or human systems in response to actual or expected climatic stimuli and their, or their effects which moderates harm or exploits beneficial opportunities. And then we talk about various types of adaptation that can be distinguished, including anticipatory, autonomous, and planned adaptation. So all of you are probably familiar with this. And I think you know, this is how we are adapting to climate change. When I look at adaptation, I go to the dictionary and I look at adaptation as the process of changing to suit different conditions. So for me, adaptation to climate change isn't just about adapting to the changes, but also about adapting to the idea that we are changing the climate, the idea that humans are having this enormous impact on the global environment. And some of my concerns have um, arisen about that we're talking about um, that will probably overshoot our current climate targets, so policies of adaptation and recovery need much more attention. And this has been important because we do need to adapt. But when we start talking about we should be planning to adapt to at least four degrees Celsius warming, I start to question things because everything I have read over the last 25 years about climate change impacts, vulnerability, and adaptation tells me that we're not gonna be able to adapt without losing many of the things that we highly value right now. So I think, well, how, come, how did we get to this point now where we're starting to talk about adapting to four degrees? Obviously, if you look at the data and where we're heading, you look at extrapolations into the future, and you see that we've had high emission scenarios. We're currently on a trajectory that it is even higher than the higher emission scenario. And so people are saying, yes, you know, it's forthcoming. We have to um, adapt to that. And if you look about, you know, think about adaptation, people, have, you know, of course we can adapt. We are humans, we have always adapted. And um, Mark Stafford Smith and I were just visiting the, uh, a new excavation in the cradle of humanity. And you see that yes, over the last two million years we have adapted, we have evolved. But the question really is, can we adapt? And what, what are we really adapting to? So I look at how are we framing the problem of climate change? And I read lots of different books and um, the, what I'm drawing on is a book from the business um, school called um, The Practice of Adaptive Leadership. And you may say, why are you reading these kind of books? But um, about 10 years ago, Colleen Vogel said to me, Karen, you really have to look at what's coming out of business schools. They understand change. And so, um, so that's really um, where, wh what got me started on this. And Heifetz and his colleagues are looking at two different types of problems in any arena of life. And the first ones are technical problems. And technical problems, are problems that can be diagnosed and solved generally within a short time frame, but not always, by applying established knowledge and know-how. And so technical problems are amenable to authoritative expertise and management of routine processes, building on current structures, procedures, and ways of doing things. So technical problems are things that we actually can do. And they're not limited to technological problems. They can also include institutional, managerial, and behavioral changes. These are things that we just need more expertise, more knowledge, more know-how to actually do. So we put our notes, you know, get down to it, organize, discuss, um, and everything, and we will be able to solve these. And so um, examples of these are probably very familiar to you. Developing effective early warning systems, building robust seawalls, 
desalinating water, producing meat in a laboratory, inventing fabrics that cool the body, revising building codes, changing zoning laws, revising insurance policies, and so on and so on and so on. And this is the kind of stuff that, um, that we are actually starting to talk more and more and more about for climate change. How do we, what do, how do we adapt to two degrees, three degrees, or four degrees? But one of the problems is that this is, my, um, and this is the, what Heifetz argued, that's not the right problem. Uh, he dis they distinguish between technical problems and adaptive challenges. And adaptive challenges are different in that they can only be addressed through changes in people's assumptions, beliefs, and worldviews, and through changes in priorities, habits, and loyalties. So adaptive challenges are not just about the to-do list of things out there, but they're about what happens in here. They involve shedding some entrenched ways of thinking and being in the world, tolerating disequilibria and losses, and also generating the capacity, capacities that we need to collectively thrive. So adaptive challenges are not like technical problems in that there's no clear linear path to follow when resolving adaptive challenges. And, uh, and this makes them very different. I was looking on the um, internet and I found a woman who has compared technical problems to adaptive challenges by talking about clocks and clouds. And clocks and things like that are their static, linear causes and effects, predictable, clearly defined boundaries, complicated, well understood, can be taken apart and analyzed, or, and there's a solution to them. Whereas dynamic systems, like the climate system, are dynamic with nonlinear causes and effects, sensitive to initial conditions, blurry boundaries, <coughs> complex, ill-defined, whole complexity is embraced by focusing on interactions between parts rather than the parts themselves. And there's multiple ways of addressing them by uh, investigating diverse worldviews. And the, I, I know I'm going through this very fast, but I just want to show you that there are differences between technical problems and adaptive challenges. Um, importantly, most adaptive challenges have technical dimensions to them. So there's no doubt that a technical, um, you know, that the technical um, issues need to be addressed. But Heifetz warned that addressing an adaptive challenge as only a technical problem is destined for failure. And, and he, um, they point that out through many cases in businesses and governments and things, that if we don't take into account all of the kind of interior subjective dimensions, we're probably likely to fail. And fortunately, we can identify an adaptive challenge by certain characteristics. And I'm going to go through seven of them that um, some of them are, that are theirs and some are my own. Um, an adaptive challenge is defined by a persistent gap between aspirations and reality. And we see that right now that we are aspiring to a less than two degree world, and yet there's a, our global um, emissions are in, um, reaching record rates. So what we want as a, um, a, you know, to avoid dangerous climate change isn't where we're heading. So there's a gap there. Another characteristic is that responses within the current repertoire are inadequate. And as we have now finished COP19, we see that over and over and over again, we're coming up with the same kind of solution. It's not even, you don't even have to go to the COP or even start the COP before they've already said that it's not going to be, that nothing's going to come out of it. So that repertoire of trying to get global um, governments to come together to um, put a limit is not actually working. So we need to think about it in a different way. Difficult learning is required. And I think that this is probably the most important because climate change is not just a complex problem. It's not just complicated, it's a hyper-complex problem. And hyper-complexity is defined by these, um, um, anyways, by dynamic complexity, where the results, um, that results when the causes and consequences are distributed over space and, um, and time, um, that should be time, creating a lag between the, our actions and outcomes. And climate change really is this, because what we do now to mitigate is actually not going to be seen for years. Hypercomplex problems are also socially complex because you, they're linked to diverse stakeholders with different values, different interests, and they all view climate change and its solutions very differently. There's emergent complexity associated with nonlinear changes that can result in new and surprising properties. And finally, human complexity, and this includes cognition, perceptions, emotions, identities, and interests that influence the way that we perceive um, changes in systems and the way that we address them. So all of these things make climate change not your average technical problem that we can address. The fourth characteristic is that new stakeholders across boundaries need to be engaged. And here we have scientists, um, policymakers, and practitioners, and those are kind of the stakeholders we normally um, bring together. But we really need to open it up and to all types of people, the artists, the engineers, the principals of schools, the chefs, 
And, um, and many different things. This, you know, you don't need to read the, the, I just took this off the internet and it's more business oriented, but we need to get everybody that's a stakeholder and not just those who are holding the stakes, but the movers and the shakers or what we call in Norway, the fire souls, because that's, those are the ones that can create the change. Also with adaptive challenges, a longer time frame is necessary. It's not just, you know, the current election cycle or whatever, or if you want to use a, um, a, a sports metaphor, it's not that we're not in it for the sprint or the, you know, the 5K or the 10K, but it's really an ultra marathon where we have to prepare for changes that, you know, the, the, although the curves I show you end at 2100, the problem is not going to end there. So we are, you know, we're, we have to be thinking and as we address one problem, new problems will um, arise. An important dimension of adaptive challenges is that the disequilibrium is experienced as a, uh, um, a, a, a disequilibrium experienced as a sense of crisis is starting to be felt. And we start to see that. I don't know if you, you know, you're, it's among your friends and family and things, but people are starting to go, um, especially in Norway when we had, you know, uh, 13 degrees in November, people are going, hmm, something is a little bit off. And, and, they're, and they're seeing what's happening in the Philippines, what's happening with food security issues as a little bit unsettling and disequilibria. And finally, you can tell an adaptive challenge when you're convinced that everybody else needs to change or adapt. Not us, not our universities, not our systems, but everybody else. And so, so that's a clear idea that there is something that might go deeper in that. So one question is, if these problems are adaptive challenges, why do we actually resist adaptive challenges? Well, first of all, they create discomfort or disequilibria. They're not comfortable. They're not, they, they bring up, and I think you've probably seen it in many discussions, that there's always things that make some people upset or angry or feel um, like they lost control because they involve real or potential losses. When you're talking to an oil company about the future and they, they have 200,000 employees or a million employees, then yeah, you create a disequilibria. When you're talking about to a community about losing their land um, to storm surges and sea level, you're creating disequilibria. When you're talking about so they are difficult. They are hard problems. They are not the um, the, the kind of things that we can um, find the solutions for. As much as we'd like to find a simple solution, geoengineering or or something. In other words, they call for deeper change. They call for kind of us to go inside as much as outside to, um, to question some of our assumptions. But we typically resist adaptive challenges. And Heifetz, um, they give two examples of um, how we do that. First, a diversion of attention. You know, we put a lot of emphasis into doing other stuff, you know, like um, recreation, um, um, yeah, anything that's, you know, other problems that are much more important to deal with right now, or um, we numb ourselves and things, or we displace responsibility. We say, well, it's up to the government to solve this. It's up to, um, you know, this country or that country, or it's up to anyone, and, and we don't actually take responsibility collectively for saying we need to do something about this. So how then do we respond um, successfully to adaptive challenge? The first thing is to recognize what the adaptive elements of the problem are. And I'm going to give you some examples from Norway to, to help you, you know, make it less abstract. Um, the second thing is to avoid, um, to explore individual and collective blind spots. I don't know if you all know what the theory, what the idea of a blind spot is, but it's usually something that's in front of us, but we just don't see it. It's like having a book on your shelf for 10 years and then suddenly realizing that it's there. You just go, oh, I haven't, I haven't seen it. And there are some things that we just don't see. We take for granted, we assume them away and things. And every organization, every culture, every um, government, every individual has those. Another part of responding to adaptive challenges is, is working, recognizing and working with different worldviews. And I think this is really important in the, um, with the climate change issue because in many ways, climate change is shattering some worldviews. It is saying that we humans are the ones that are creating the changes in the global system as opposed to gods or sunspots or anything else. So it's, um, and we all see the world in very different ways through different lenses. And to be able to connect with people who don't see the world the same way as a climate scientist working with a complex um, nonlinear model with you know, X factors and things is really important. 
It's important to also identify hidden assumptions and beliefs. Often our beliefs are things that we've just kind of gotten through our, you know, like schooling, through um, our society and things. And some of these beliefs really influ influence our ideas of whether we can actually challenge the changes or not challenge the changes. And we have a lot of assumptions, and I'll, I'll show you some of those um, for Norway as well. But our hidden assumptions and beliefs are those things that we actually look right through. We don't look at them and say, oh, I have this belief, but I don't, you don't even know that you have these beliefs. And finally, uh, connecting with the core values of others, what, what matters to them. And I think, um, also I'll give this an, ex an example, that sometimes we really miss the motivating factors, the things that really um, uh, um, drive people to change. So what I'm saying then is that we really need to focus on the adaptive work associated with climate change rather than only the technical <coughs> aspects. And by technical aspects, again, I don't mean just the technological things, but all the things that we could, as a society, we're pretty good at. How, do we, how are we going to store renewable energy and batteries? All, you know, how are we going to you know, get, get these people from here? Those are technical things, but the adaptive challenges go much deeper. They mean that we have to address cultural issues and um, emotional issues, whether it's about um, displaced populations or about just new um, different types of changes. So I'm going to talk a little bit about Norway now, because Norway is a country that is considered to have the highest adaptive capacity that you could imagine. So in Norway, we can adapt to any, anything, really. So um, it's one of the wealthiest countries in the world. So when you're looking at adaptive capacity indicators, we, um, you know, it's like, oh, okay, wealth. It's ranked number one in terms of human development. So there's um, it's, um, a very developed um, country, egalitarian, high gender equity. Um, one of the highest um, rates of official development assistance, high le levels of education, low levels of corruption, all of these things give it, in the, if you look at just adaptive capacity, you say like, oh, Norway can adapt to anything. And Norway thinks that they can adapt to, most Norwegians do. But Norway's economy is highly reliant on oil, or it has been over the, it's become that way over the past 50 years. Um, we're one of the largest oil exporting country, um, countries in the world mostly because most of our electricity comes from hydro um, power. So, so we have an issue where our wealth, yeah, our, our idea that we can adapt is really um, we're assumed to be tied very much to oil. It's also a country that has agriculture, it relies on agriculture, fishing, natural resources in many ways. So, so this idea that you know, we have to adapt um, hits us hard because it is a, it's, it's a resource-based economy, it's an oil-based economy. And if you ask Norwegians then, you know, are you concerned about climate change? Are you worried about it? Generally, they, they go, yeah, four degrees, you know, this will be great. And we see this time and time again that you can talk about higher rain, more, you know, all of the different um, things. And, and people will say, yeah, good, bring it on. <laughs> you know, and, and this is, you know, this is the, the common, you know, everyday people that, that you talk to, but it is also supported by research, and I, I'll just translate these. Um, Norway can, um, can tolerate climate change. It's the other countries in the world that really have to be worried about it because you know, we're, not gonna be, um, we're not gonna be over flooded or anything. Um, Norway will, um, will get away easier with a changing climate, and this was just from like last, a few weeks ago, that you know, yeah, well yes, we still need to do it for the other countries, but it's not a problem for Norway. And even when you take this, ecolo the ecological climate crisis can be a gold mine for Norway. We, put, we do an economic model and we see that Norway, Nor Norwegians can earn seven billion kroner if we don't do anything about climate change. So you have this idea. And, <laughs> and so as an adaptive challenge, I say, well, what are the assumptions here? And one of the assumptions, especially in the economic models, is that we're alone. We don't need the rest of the world. We don't have trade. We don't have migration. We, don't, we are disconnected. And when you start to bring in that Norway is part of the rest of the world, you start to see that yeah, we've got to um, change. This we can adapt to anything attitude is even goes for things like that are very important to the national identity, like um, snow. And we know that winter temperature in will increase by two and a half to four degrees by 2100, according to the climate models. And we know that there'll be a 40% decrease in the number of days with suitable skiing conditions by 2050. And if anyone has been to Norway or watched any of the world championships and things, you know that this actually matters to Norwegians. And so um, we just think like, well, but we're Norwegian, we can adapt to anything. And so people are adapting. We see skis on wheels. We see you know, people are coming up with any different ways to adapt. And looking at this as an adaptive challenge, I say, wait a minute. There are actually different worldviews in Norway. 
there are people who are approaching this differently. So in our study of um, adaptation, we looked at traditional values in Norway, which are very strong. We say that, yes, snow cover is important to local and national identity. You know, we have the sweaters, we, we are snow. And I have, you know, young relatives who just cannot imagine a world without snow. They're skiers, they're, you know. Okay. And from a technical problem, if we approach it as a technical problem for adaptation, we'll go into communities and we'll figure out how to transform livelihoods, how we can sustain rural populations, which is already a problem because people are moving to cities. So, so the, the, the politics of keeping um, rural areas um, alive has always been a problem. But we also would have to address the psychological factors because if anyone has been in a dark area, the snow makes a difference. It lightens up the winter and you get a lot of seasonal um, depression if there is, you know, in, in the darkest of winters. So when in the winters where we don't have snow, it's a very different winter in it than um, with the winter with snow. So those are all the technical things that we can do. But the adaptive challenge then is, well, how do we actually maintain a cultural heritage and an identity that is so much tied to nature and snow and everything? And you know, just, so, just in thinking about this, well, stories, art, snow museums, these types of things. But in some way, we're going to have to address that adaptive challenge um, in that way. And maybe the psychological factors goes into that. So this is one view of it. But one of the more dominant views is more with, associated with modern values. And modern values see snow, snow cover as a medium for winter sports and an important economic sector. It attracts tourists in the winter, et cetera. And in this way, we say that, and I had a student once who <laughs> was like, we, we, you know, we, we, we make better snow, so we, we don't need to have snow. We just truck it in. And we do that. I mean, before before they, the trucks drive by my house every winter before a big competition, truckloads of snow. So as a technical problem, we'll focus on snowmaking technologies, indoor ski domes like they have in um, um, Abu Dhabi, and artificially schooled um, ski tracks, or simply new sports. You know, we just turn the ski slopes and things like that into mountain bike paths and things. The adaptive challenge here is to reconstruct or reinvent an identity, find new niche markets, and you know, like. How, you know, how do we actually redefine ourselves? And from a modern perspective, people say, oh, we turn the ski slopes into conference centers and spas, no problem. You know, like, they're, they're, um, there's, it's, it's a can do, yes we can. So this is where a lot of the, the, um, the positive approach to climate change comes from. But with postmodern values, where you start to see a bigger system, you start to see snow not just as something for fun or national identity, you start to see snow as part of an ecosystem, part of our whole, you know, like the flood regimes and water hydro hydrological cycle. So it's part of ecosystem integrity. We see it in terms of systems changes. We actually recognize that there are distant impacts of climate change on other countries that we are connected to. And the technical problem here starts to get reframed as adaptive management, building resilience, promoting sustainability, more big picture solutions. But the real adaptive challenge then is to recognize like, that climate change mitigation is the biggest adaptation that we could actually do to adapt to climate change. So from all of these different val values things, you get people to the table and they're all seeing the problem differently, interpreting it differently, and thinking up different solutions. And I think one of the, um, the challenges we have is to actually communicate what, the, what, you know, what climate change means for different groups and things. And every year I go to um, Christmas for, to my husband's. He, he grew up on a sheep farm. And um, this is not the farm, and this is not the great-great-great-grandfather. But this is something that they bring out. You know, the great-great-great-great-grandfather sits on the wall, and they talk about him all the time. And, and they bring out his, his, the, um, the, the logs of what was produced in, that's like 1818, 1819, 1820, you can see in 1823 that it was just a weak yield. And they talk about him as if he's in the room. So whereas I come in, I'm like, I work on climate change and we've got to think about the future and future generations and future, future, they're always going to the past. And that made me realize that when I connect with the values of my family and friends and things like that, you have to switch it around and not get to this abstract future, but just say, you know, like, yes, we will be remembered. People will be sitting 200 years um, from now not looking at our, our, our agriculture. They're looking at our Twitter posts, our blogs, our everything that we have as a track. And so this idea that you will be remembered is something that gets people more right here than, um, than you know, think about complex nonlinear reactions into the future. And so connecting with traditional values, connecting with the modern things, see, seeing the opportunities is really important. <coughs> Meeting adaptive challenges then, you know, to kind of sum up, requires that, um, an adaptive formulation of the problem. 
we need to see how, the, um, how, how exactly how this challenge of climate change comes up against the current limits of our own mental complexity, our own way of thinking it. You know, how does it challenge our own, you know, like constructions, our own mental models, our own worldviews? And that isn't a, an easy task, and that's why we call it an adaptive challenge. But we also have to um, find an adaptive solution that we ourselves have to figure out how we, you know, it's not them adapting or that adapting or the, the, the checklist of things. How do we ourselves adapt to this idea that we are actually right now in the next, you know, 10 years influencing the trajectory of the future? Um, and this is where I will argue that Yes, it's important to adapt um, all these different systems and take the technolo technolo um, technical solutions. That's absolutely necessary, but we also need to adapt from the inside out. And I would argue even first, if we want to um, successfully adapt to the world out there um, to climate change. So adapting from the inside out is really looking at our, our assumptions, our beliefs, our, our worldviews, how they differ, how they change, what actually influences them. So it's, it's very much uh, what I, I refer to as the deeper human dimensions of the problem. And we've discussed the human dimensions for years, but we haven't really gone into the deeper human dimensions. And there is a lot of research on this in, um, on, you know, um, psychology, developmental psychology, um, neuro, um, neurosciences on, on neuroplasticity and because we see how we're getting more and more understanding of how and why we um, do things what we do and and how we can actually um, deliberately um, change and I want to point out because everyone goes yes yes we've got to change everybody's values and everybody's worldviews and then it becomes almost like an oppressive project because it is really difficult to change anybody else's values if anyone has <laughs> is married they know that the, um, <laughs> You, you, it can be oppressive and it can be unethical. And we do this through brainwashing, indoctrination all the time, you know, through television and, and things. But, but it is not easy to change anyone else. So the only person you can really change is yourself, your organization, your, your community, or whatever, as a collective um, you know, project. So in other words, what I'm saying is it's more effective to build your own capacity to do adaptive work in order to help others deal with the adaptive challenge of climate change, rather than saying like, oh, I listened to a talk on the adaptive challenge and now you've got to change inside, and, and that, that doesn't happen that way. So to understand change rather than climate change, I think is really one of the, the challenges for research in the coming years, because we, we do know a lot about social change. And we know that social change, like climate change, is nonlinear, that there are tipping points and inflection points and things. So that gives me a lot more optimism for the future. But where I want to end is that adaptation in and of itself, when we talk about adapting to four degrees of change, it's not neutral. It's not apolitical. It is, and, and I reread um, a couple years ago a book by Paulo Freire called Pedagogy of the Oppressed, which is really about liberation pedagogy. And I read it with like my climate change glasses on, and, um, and I just want to read this because it's, um, it is about how, you know, whether if we're adapting to four degrees, is this really adaptation or is it maladaptation? It says, the educated individual is the adapted person because she or he is better fit for the world. Translated into practice, this concept is well suited to the purpose of the, I'll call them polluters, whose tranquility rests on how well people fit the world the polluters have created and how little they question it. The more completely the majority adapt to the purposes which the dominant minority prescribe for them, thereby depriving them of the right to their own purposes, the more easily the minority can continue to pollute, prescribe, whatever. The oppressors develop a series of methods precluding any presentation of the world as a problem and showing it rather as a fixed entity, as something given, something to which people as mere spectators much, must adapt. And I think we're kind of falling into that when we start to talk about adapting to four degrees rather than questioning, the, you know, challenging the systems, the structures, the power interests, the loyalties, the habits, everything that is really you know, part of being human. And so, Adapting to four degrees isn't, you know, in the long evolutionary perspective, I think, adapting to, um, to climate change. It's maladapting. And, um, and I think that the exciting thing is that more and more people are starting to realize that, um, that this is not just a normal problem, but it is an adaptive challenge. And in Norway, you know, that whether it, it hit me in preparing for this talk when I thought Norway can adapt to anything. Well, why can't we adapt then to a low carbon society? Why can't we adapt oil? Why can't we, and, and the assumption would be that oil is not for burning. There's many um, uses, oil is a valuable resource. So reframing and, and really rethinking and presenting to Norway the opportunity to deal with an adaptive challenge and putting it on a map where Norway is part of the world, I think is, um, is dealing with adaptation in a very different way. 
So that kind of sums up the way that I see adaptation. And, and as I, you know, the more I think about it, the more I am hesitant to actually look for the technical solutions for four degrees, even though we need technical solutions for today's vulnerability and tomorrow's vulnerability and you know, the vulnerability 10 years from now. But for the long term, it really is an evolutionary type of adaptation in our thinking and how we think about change. So thank you.